Okay, so this is the second video in this series that I'm slowly publishing about phased array beamformers. Uh, sorry about the slowness part. I'll, I'll try to release videos more frequently. But in each video, I'll use real hardware to explore these concepts and help you gain an intuitive understanding of them. In the last video, we looked at how to electronically steer these antennas using a phase shift applied to each of the antenna elements in the array. And we saw a good correlation between the value that the equation gave and the value that we measured with real hardware. So that is to say that we saw the highest amplitude of the signal when we set our phase shifts to what the equation predicted. But if you remember, we also saw a variety of lesser peaks and nulls, and these were not predicted by our equation. So the questions are, are these real? Where do they come from? And are they a problem? And just to answer those questions, uh, yes, they are real, and yes, they are a big problem. So let's dig into understanding them now. And to dig into that, we first need to go through a bit of math uh, but this is also a great time to highlight my friend Marshall Bruner's channel. He is doing some very cool animations around these concepts. So I'll leave a link in the description to those videos and his channels. Uh, please check those out. They look much nicer than these PowerPoint style graphics that I'm doing. But either way, it's helpful to first consider that the total antenna gain is actually a function of two parts. It's a function of the element factor and it's a function of the array factor. The element factor is the radiating pattern from a single element of the array. This is defined by the construction of the element, and it's not something that we can change electrically. So we'll just leave it as a constant in our analysis. In my next video, we'll look at measuring this, uh, as well as measuring the total antenna gain. But for this video, we're going to focus on the array factor. The array factor is the portion of the antenna gain that we can influence by beamforming. Uh, this is the impact of all the antenna elements getting summed together. And remember that for almost everything that I'm talking about, I'm going to keep it to a linear array, specifically an eight by one equally spaced linear array. And we'll do all the math and experiments for that case. But a linear array is the building block from which many other array types can spring out of. So it is very instructive to start with this first. The array factor equation for a linear array is derived in many places. And so I won't try to repeat that derivation here. If you're interested though, I recommend Dr. Arik Brown's books uh, as an excellent resource for this. But basically what the array factor equation is, is the result after summing all of the signals after phase shifting each of them. And then we do some trigonometric math and simplify with an assumption of steering near mechanical bore sight. And the end result we get is this sine n over n times sine type of equation. And it may not be intuitively obvious what this equation means. Uh, so let's plot out a few cases. Here's that array factor equation plotted for different numbers of elements. The x-axis is steering angle, uh, which theta, which you'll remember from the last video, is just a function of the phase shift applied to each of the elements. Uh, we could plot that phase shift on the x-axis, but most of us don't think in terms of phase shift, so, so it makes sense to just convert that to a steering angle. So in this plot, n is the number of elements, and you can see that as the number of elements increases from 2 to 4 to 8, that the main lobe beam width narrows. And when we calculated what phase shift to apply, we were calculating that for the main lobe. But now you can see that in addition to a main lobe, we also get these side lobes. And as the number of elements increases, the number of side lobes and nulls also increases. We saw these side lobes and nulls in the last video when we were looking at the received gain and we swept the steering angle. And now the origin of them from that equation is apparent. And these side lobes are a problem, uh, so we'll want to learn some methods to deal with them. Uh, and that is a huge field of study and something I'll cover in the next couple of videos. But for now, let's see if we can measure this array pattern with the hardware that we have in the lab. And before we do that, let's first calculate some numbers so that we can compare our measurements uh, to the equation. The first thing we can measure in our lab is the width of that main lobe. The array factor equation predicts that we can reduce the main lobe beam width by increasing the number of elements. And remember that for a linear, uniformly distributed array, increasing the number of elements means that our aperture diameter is increasing. So how do you measure the width of the main lobe? Most commonly, we talk about the half power beam width. So at what point does our main lobe lose half of its power? Half power is minus 3 dB on the decibel scale. So the main lobe beam width measured 3 dB down from its peak. 3 dB in log terms is the same as 1 over the square root of 2 in linear terms. So solving the array factor equation for 1 over the square root of 2 gives a half power beam width of 13 degrees for an eta element array. And in the table, you can see how it increases with decreasing numbers of elements. 
Again, this is for a uniformly distributed linear array. And again, this is what the equation predicts. We'll see how close we come to this with my setup. Another thing that we can use the array factor equation for is to look at the null to null spacing of the main lobe. This is just another way to measure that, that main lobe beam width. And it's a little bit easier because the nulls are very pronounced. Uh, so measuring the first null beam width is sometimes easier to do than trying to measure the half power beam width. And of course, a null is zero. So we just solve the array factor equation for a phase shift that gives us a zero. So an eight element array at 10.3 gigahertz has a 30 degree null to null spacing of the main lobe. Uh, and these are all measurements that we can make on our phaser hardware setup. So let's try that out now and see how close our calculations come to the actual measured values. So if you recall from last time, this is what our hardware looks like. And there's a link there if you want more information, but it's an eight element receive array that goes to two beam forming ICs, the ADAR 1000s, and then to two mixers, which mix our 10 gigahertz frequency down to something in the range of Pluto. And here's the diagram of how that is all connected. So we digitize the data with the Pluto SDR and then plot it out. The signal that we are looking at comes from this little hobbyist HB 100 X microwave source that I talked about in the last video. Uh, so you'll see this little black puck with the blinking LEDs, and that is just shining down a 10 ish gigahertz sine wave onto our array. And then we plot the power as we sweep the receive beam. I've got a bit larger room in my basement that I'll switch to now, and you'll see how this works out in real life. So let me go to that setup now. Uh, and actually, I'm going to pull up a previous recorded video of this setup that I did for a different presentation, but it's all the same. Uh, so let me just talk through it now. So let's run our Python program again, but this time we're going to sweep the phase deltas of all the elements and plot the peak amplitude we receive from each of those states. So this uh, generates now a pretty cool plot of the array factor. And we generate this data in exactly the same way that we did in the previous lab. In that lab, we stepped the steering angle and plotted the peak FFT amplitude. And we're doing the same thing here. It's just that we're able to step hundreds of steering angles per second and then plot the peak FFT amplitude for each of those steering angles. And this allows us to change some variables and instantly see the impact of the array pattern. Let's try that now by moving the antenna around and noting how the peak response follows that direction of arrival angle. Note also how the beam width of the main lobe widens as we approach either horizon. That wasn't predicted in our simplified equation, but we're going to add to that equation in our next section and talk about uh, why that beam width widens as we approach the horizon. And if we click on the polar plot uh, option, this brings up a polar representation. So it's the exact same data. It's just pl plotted on a polar coordinate system. This is interesting. You see a lot of antenna plots like this. It kind of accentuates some features. And again, we can, uh, uh, we, we can rotate, uh, rotate around and we'll see the impact there. This time I'm rotating the HP 100. It's, you know, it's the same thing. And we can also view the FFT. This is the FFT at the peak of that whole scan from horizon to horizon. Uh, it's just a useful debug tool in case something is, is amiss. But this peak here at uh, minus 11, minus 10, minus 11 is going to correspond to the peak that we see here at minus 10. And you can see that those side lobes and nulls look pretty similar to what we derived from that antenna factor equation. But let's actually make some measurements and see if they truly match with what we calculated. So to do this, we'll move the HP100 directly in front of the array. Um, again, that's, the, that's called the broadside or the mechanical board site position. So we just wanna make sure that that's uh, squared up. Um, and the reason we do that is because that's that's where the simplified equations are going to be the most accurate, is, is at the mechanical bore site direction. Uh, so now we can start making some measurements here. So we can, uh, first of all, see that that our peak should be right around zero. Here's our peak at about, about two degrees. You can see in this upper right-hand corner, there's some coordinates up there. And uh, our gain here, it's a little truncated there from the screen, but it looks like minus nine. Um, 
So if we go 3 dB down from that in either direction, we can measure our half power beam width. So 3 dB down from minus 9 is minus 12. So I go over here to minus 12. That's about 6 degrees. And then I go to this side here, also minus 12. And that's about 9 degrees. So 6 plus 9, 15 degrees. So that's our half power beam width that we measured, 15 degrees from here to here. We could do the same with the null to null spacing. So here's the, for the first null, here's the first null here at uh, minus 13.7 degrees. And the other null here at 16 degrees. So that's, um, that's 40, that's um, 30 degrees. First null null spacing. Uh, we can also measure the uh, amplitude of the first side lobe. This will be more interesting when we start to look at tapering, but um, remembering that our peak is at minus nine. And then this first side lobe here is at minus 21. So that's a 12 degree, I mean, I'm sorry, a 12 dB difference between the peak and the first side lobe. So it's, we call it 12 dBc, 12 dB down from uh, this peak carrier here. And here's a summary of those measurements that we just made. We recorded about a 15 degree half power beam width, or if you'll remember for an ALM and array, we had calculated that it should be 13 degrees. And then a, a 30 degree null to null spacing for the first null. Um, we, had, we had also calculated 30 degrees. The first null to null spacing is, is a little bit easier, a little more accurate to get a read on because these nulls are so sharp and deep. The half power beam width, is, it's difficult because of these, how lightly this tapers out. Um, doesn't give you a super sharp measurement there. And then the, um, the first side lobe here, we measured minus 12 dBc. So the, the difference between the peak and the first side lobe was 12 dB, and it will be the same on the other, the other side too. Again, just remember that number. Uh, the number turns out, the ideal number turns out to be minus 13 dB, but um, we, will, we will cover that when we, uh, when, we, when we get into tapering. And here's just a reminder of what we had calculated for those half power beam widths for the different numbers of elements. Uh, similarly, here's our numbers, 30 degrees, first null beam width for eight element array, and then much wider for the other two. So now let's use our phaser board to measure what a four element or a two element array would look like. Now, we can't rip antenna elements out of the phaser board. That would, uh, that would not be good. But uh, what we can do is we can decrease the number of elements that are active here. So watch, watch what happens as I, right now we have all eight elements enabled. I'm going to copy this eight element uh, array into memory here and then go to, go to four elements. So there, so in green is our eight element array and you can see it's got that nice half power beam width. The four element array in blue is a much wider half power beam width. Also, the gain has gone down uh, by quite a bit because of course we have fewer elements summing into it. And of course we can do a two element array, which is going to be very, very broad. And the gain uh, goes down even further. So we just measured the array factor pattern of our antenna array. And we saw measured values that were fairly close to what we calculated. But we also saw that as we steered the array away from mechanical bore sight, that the main lobe beam width widened. And this is because that array factor equation that I gave you earlier, it was simplified for just something near mechanical bore sight. But if the steering angle is not near mechanical bore sight, then this slightly longer equation is the real equation to use. That sine theta term in there, that distorts our beam and it widens the beam width. It's, it's like viewing the array from a high incident angle. You only see a fraction of the surface of the array, culminating at a viewing angle of theta of 90 degrees, where you would not see the line at all. You would just see a point. So as we steer off of bore sight, the antenna array's aperture appears to be getting smaller and it's the aperture that sets the beam width. I've been saying it's the number of elements that sets the beam width, but what I meant by that is for a uniform linear array, the number of elements directly sets your aperture size. And you can see what this new equation looks like in this plot. The plot is for 32 elements, where the spacing between each element is equal to half the wavelength of the carrier. So you can see how it starts pretty narrow at bore sight, and then broadens a bit at 30 degrees, and then really widens out quite a bit at a 60 degree steering angle. 
And in this plot, I'm showing that the side lobes stay the same, uh, but we saw them decrease a bit when we actually measured this, and that is due to the element factor. We'll explore more about the element factor in the next video. For now, I want to leave you with a good way to understand what is happening in the program, what is happening underneath the hood. That Python GUI, which is available on ADI's GitHub site, um, it's not very good for learning how to program these up for yourself. Uh, and it's okay for me to criticize it because I wrote it. Um, and the GUI does work, but if you look at the code for it, it's just a rat's nest of functions and GUI commands and, and band-aided things to help with plotting. So don't look to that for an example of how to do this. Instead, let me give you a more simplified script to follow. In the last video, I did that simplified script in Python, but for this video, let me switch to MATLAB and show you what that looks like. I know many of you use and prefer MATLAB, and it's very easy to do all this programming and data collection in MATLAB, and then take advantage of all the powerful add-ons that MATLAB has created. The scripts that I'm going to show you were developed by George Menkoff and Dr. Hongling Chen at MathWorks, so a uh, very special thanks to them. I'll put a link in the description on where to find these. And I'll also put the link in there on how to modify your setup to run in MATLAB instead of Python. But again, it's all, it's all very easy. So I'm just going to open one of those scripts that George created, and we'll look at the array factor plot of this hardware in MATLAB. You can just download these from this GitHub folder, then navigate to that folder from within MATLAB. First, you'll want to run a face calibration of the array. This really only needs to be done once, and there's a routine to do this in that GitHub folder. And you can see uh, what the before and after plots look like for that calibration, as well as what the theoretical ideal array factor would be. Then to run the example in this video, open up the MATLAB live scripts called Antenna Pattern Lab, and that live script will first load those calibration offsets from the calibration script. And then you can choose how many elements you want to enable in the array. The default is eight, but you could select four or two. And then George handles all the phaser object interaction in this antenna interactor function. You can dig more into that if you want. The antenna model is created using the phased array toolbox. And you can see that it's just a simple eight element linear array. Then we collect data from that phaser board. Uh, we're sweeping the steering angle from minus 90 degrees to plus 90 degrees, and then just plotting the power level for each of those steering angles. And here's what that pattern looks like for our array at Mechanical Boresight, which you can see uh, that it is. But I'll rerun it here, moving the array over to about minus 30 degrees. So I'll hit run again and that'll update all the plots. And you can see now that our peak power is at minus 30 degrees, uh, and also see that wider half power beam width that we just talked about. So great plots and very easy to use. Uh, you can play around with this and make any changes that you want. And again, this is all on the MathWorks GitHub page that I will post a link to in the description for this video. Okay, I hope that that was helpful to understand where these side lobes are coming from, and hopefully it was helpful to see some manipulation of them in real time with real hardware. In the next video, we'll actually measure the element pattern and the overall antenna gain, uh, or at least I'll show you my quick and cheap way to do it. Uh, it should be fun, and hopefully it helps you to connect all these pieces together. And then in future videos, we'll look at the key methods that people use to deal with side lobes. So if that sounds interesting, please subscribe. And I will try to get those videos out much sooner. Uh, thanks for watching.